Okay, so in this talk, I'll be taking a look at a history of the mine. I'll be taking a look at some photos from the late 1970s. Uh, these were photos that Joe Lister showed me. So they're his photos. And then when I went out to interview him, he said, well, let's go on a tour of the, you know, what's left of the mine. So that's what we did. And so my photos are from that 2017 interview. I can click to the next thing on this slide. So our tour guide will be Joe Lister. He's the guy in the picture there in the white shirt. He started working at the mine in 1978. He first got hired as an electrician. He worked his way into a position as a miner because that's where you got the most pay. And then he became a mine manager and that was really the position he held uh, until the time that I interviewed him. Okay, next slide, please. Here's the Grants Uranium District in the in setup in the upper left there. You can see that the Grants Uranium District is in kind of in the northwest part of the state. It's about, well, Grants is about 75 miles from Albuquerque and then Mount Taylor Mines about another 25 miles outside of Grants. So you can see there the location of the Mount Taylor Mine. Now, uh, the actual top of Mount Taylor is about seven miles to the south of the mine. So that's something sometimes I just see in the articles in the newspaper about it. Sometimes when people say the Mount Taylor mine, they think somehow it's at the top of Mount Taylor, um, and it's not. Uh, I've even seen a picture that discussed the Mount Taylor mine that showed the very top of the mountain. And those are really two separate things. So Mount Taylor itself is an old volcano. It's uh, conical in, in shape, uh, so kind of rounded. And the Mount Taylor mine really sits at the base of that cone. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Just very briefly, um, uranium was discovered in the 1950s, and several of the major operators set up shop during that time. Uh, operate the 1950s, 60s, into the 70s. And so when the Mount Taylor mines started development in 1974, so they were kind of late uh, on the scene compared to these other companies that had been there for uh, quite some time. Next slide, please. They started uh, sinking shafts at the Mount Taylor mine. First, they put the buildings there on the surface. What you see in this picture from that era are the first building there are the offices and the change rooms and then the hoist house is in back of that and then you can see the two hoists on either side of the hoist house the one on the left is a little hard to spot there that's the smaller hoist and then you have some uh, trailers there that were used for the contractors okay next slide please so here they are sinking the 24 foot shaft. Uh, this is the one that would haul the equipment and the ore. Um, so in sinking the shaft, uh, Joe says, just you know, in regard to this picture, uh, that's what the bottom of the shaft looks like when we were sinking. And then in the upper part of that picture, you see that's the work deck. Next slide, please. Uh, this is drilling. Uh, we were grouting. Just reading what Joe's saying here. Uh, we'd have a drill set up. We'd drill 200 foot holes. We'd drill them straight down or off to an angle, a wider angle, all the way around. And then uh, we'd pump grout. That grout soft seals the ground, seals the sandstone, so the water flow isn't so great coming in. Then in that cone, we'd sink the shaft by drilling six feet at a time, blasting it, taking it to the surface. So that's what they're doing in those two pictures there. And by 1976, they had about, between about 150 and 200 workers at the site. Next slide, please. Now this is a picture from 2017. That's Joe there. He was gonna explain to me how the cement, how the buckets were working. Um, so he's standing on the cement bucket there on the left. He says, that's how we poured our cement. You jump on the cement bucket at the Galloway you're up on this side, you drive the bucket down the last 150 feet, you'd open the gate, let the cement come out, bang on the gate a little bit, knock all the concrete out. 
And then in reference to the sinking buckets over there, uh, when we were sinking shaft, we dried up and down in the bucket. Everything goes up and down in that bucket, the supplies, the men, everything, the muck. You were only supposed to ride eight men inside. You got a 12 man crew. The hoist man isn't going to make two trips. We'd stand on the rim. He also said that that was done more on the night shift when the safety inspectors weren't around so much. Probably not a real great policy, but anyways, that's what was done. Next slide, please. <clears throat> well, they installed a huge fan there for ventilation. So ventilation is very important for keeping the radon levels down some. And here, um, Joe explains the upper left breaking out the tights there. Uh, we were up here with a rock breaker breaking out the tights. We'd break that out, which what would allow us to pour that in concrete. So you can see the concrete pad that they used for the fan there. And the person on top of that fan gives you some idea uh, of the scale of that. And Joe says, so you ask, how do you move all that stuff underground that weighs 10 tons? We use a block and tackle, and we use a very small air hoist. If you were up on the surface, you would have a hydraulic crane up there. Very simple, just lift it up. Everything you see there has to be taken down the shaft and brought back into place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ground support was a major issue because the surrounding host rock was sandstone, so it's very soft and moves around quite a bit. So here on the left, he's illustrating the heaving of the ground. He says, this is a post, and then there's a cap that sits right on top of the post. Usually they're at right angles. We had this ground that was heaving this post up and bending the cap. It's a lot of force within that cap. And then on the right there, they're installing the cable bolts and grouting them in place. I will say, um, as can be expected with mining, still a very dangerous operation. And uh, two men died during the construction of the shaft. Uh, one man died from an object, uh, kind of a four inch object that fell, uh, I, I presume quite a distance. And then another man died also from uh, something falling on him. Next slide, please. So here's the Mount Taylor mining schematic. Now you can see it's, it's not drawn to scale, so you're actually, the mining level is about 3,100 feet down. So uh, quite a long ways to uh, build the shaft down there and then the haulage level below that. And that's what they're going over, going for there. The uranium ore is the dark rock and the lighter rock is the waste rock. So uh, not necessarily anything pretty to look at, nothing for the mineral collection, but uh, that's what they were uh, hauling out of there. Next slide, please. So finally, after many years of development of the 3,000 foot shafts, they can finally begin production. And just at that time, there uh, were some problems facing uranium mining generally, and then even with other operators in the area. So the Three Mile Island accident occurred, and that lowered the demand for uranium. We saw a cutback in nuclear power plants. People got scared off of using uh, nuclear energy. Uh, Kerr McGee uh, faced a loss and placed their operation on standby. And United Nuclear, uh, they had a, their tailings dam broke. Uh, their place out near Church Rock, that's closer to Gallup, uh, west of Grants. And it cost them quite a bit of money to uh, clean that up. But Gulf had actually invested quite a large sum to develop the Mount Taylor mine, and so they mined it. So you can see uh, they employed around 700 people at one time, but in December of 82, they closed the Mount Taylor mine. So it went bust at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So in April of 85, uh, Chevron resumes production. So at the time, uh, this was at least one of the largest corporate mergers in US history, and they decided to mine it. <clears throat> so from this point forward, um, the mine produced, you know, when they opened it, got it going again, 
produce 600 tons a day with only 175 employees. Now at this time, you know, most of the other operations were closed down um, and they really had the cream of the crop to pick from. They had the top level miners to choose from. Uh, so they chose people who were uh, most productive. And you can see there on the left, there's Joe Lister. Uh, he was the guy from the previous picture. Uh, this is the picture there. You can see is taken in 1986. And the other guy there is Jack Burgess. So he was, I interviewed him a few years prior and actually that's how I got to meet Joe was Jack introduced me to, to Joe. So mining ended in uh, 1990. And so, uh, okay, next slide, please. So now we'll take a look at what's left of the Mount Taylor mine. Um, in my personal opinion, I think this would be a tremendous museum, but I don't know if they have any plans to preserve the above ground workings. I mean, it's like they went out and shut the door and a lot of things look just exactly like they did uh, when people left. So I think it's very interesting just what they did with it or maybe what they left it as. Um, so this was the tour that I did in June of 2017. So Joe says, uh, this is the big dry, half of it. The other room is just on the other side of the shower room. This is typically what we'd wear underground, rubber boots, slickers, mine belt with self rescuers, hard hats. We'd usually take our rubber boots and cut holes in them so the water would go in and out so we could take them off. Otherwise you couldn't hardly take them off. There for a while, we'd work in long johns underground because some of the working areas were saturated, temperatures of 95 to 100 degrees, very, very hot. We washed everybody's clothes here. You weren't allowed to take your clothes home. We'd wash them, give them back to you, and you don't ever get to take them home. That was done to reduce uranium contamination so that the clothes would not be taken home to possibly uh, contaminate home environments and cause problems with other people, uh, such as family members. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the first aid room. <clears throat> and you can see it's just, I asked him, well, is this, you know, it looks like you close the door and everything's still there, yep. Uh, so Joe says, this is our first aid room. Very interesting things happened here. We would have heat stress cases, sometimes six, seven a shift. The first case that I, was really involved with was a very large fellow that we brought in here. He had a little bitty EMT, Angie. This guy, his core temperature was 106. She gave him an ice water enema. You imagine what happened after that. But it took his core temperature down, just dropped it like a rock. So, uh, okay. And next, uh, the Gatorade dispenser. Uh, Joe says, we're the single largest buyer of Gatorade west of the Mississippi, dispensed it here. Even with that, we had lots of heat stress cases. The mine employed about 700 men in the first two years of mining. The mine closed down for a couple of years and then reopened with a force of 175 men. The second time we mined, we never gave any Gatorade away. We stressed a better diet, more water and less alcohol. That was a winning combination. You could not drink beer and work here. You would dehydrate very quickly. So imagine that, miners who didn't drink beer. Okay, uh, next. Here's the boot wash. Joe explains this. When you come up from underground, you have uranium on your boots. We, don't, we want you to wash them off so you don't track it all the way through the offices. And then the water lines there uh, this mine, mine produces lots of water, up to 4,500 gallons a minute. We pump in these 12-inch lines vertically for over 3,000 feet. Now, the mine is not currently being uh, pumped out, so the lower workings are flooded. Uh, next, please. And here's one of the shafts. Um, you can only see, of course, a few feet down of the total 3,300 feet. So this is the small shaft, the 14 foot shaft. Uh, this is the shaft that all of the men and some of the material go up and down in. And you can see it's concrete lined. Uh, next. And here's the top part of that uh, 14 foot shaft. It holds 60 men at a time. 
Next. And here's the big shaft, the 24 foot shaft. You can go to the next slide. We'll take a closer look at the bottom of that. Joe, Joe explains this. Uh, the skips came up this compartment and continued up the head frame, dump into the ore bin right here. It would come into this 250 ton bin. The truck would come underneath here. These gates, these are guillotined. It would open up and put ore in. Uh, this beam across here levels that out so when he drives underneath the scanner, he doesn't hit the scanner. Okay, next slide, please. There's the scanner. Uh, the scanner looks at it radiometrically and says this is pile one material or pile two, three, four. The truck driver looks at that and he goes to the appropriate pile and dumps, comes back. He loads 25 tons. The skip is 12 tons. So every two skips is one truck load. Truck load cycle is about seven minutes. The skip cycle is about four minutes. So he can stay up with it very easily. And we have a storage bin that's 250 tons, should he not. Okay. And that's Joe's place where he stays out there. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Joe explains here, that's a vent fan. We take the moisture off the head frame. There's a 45 degree incline shaft that goes from the bottom of this fan and breaks into the shaft. So what happens is we turn on this uh, high volume, low pressure fan. It pulls air out of the shaft, up the evase tube. Uh, where it disperses the energy in that tube. It produces a rooster tail that goes up about 400 feet. So the dispersion of radon happens up there and it disperses very quickly. So there's no radon at ground surface. Uh, it's the radon that kills people. This is a guillotine chute that we close with an electric hoist that we can lower should we be working on that fan. It's on rails, it rolls out. That fan is the whole bottom structure. And that way, should workers fall in there, they don't go the rest of the 3,000 foot ride down. They stop right there. Probably the guillotine would kill them if they fell that far. At least we'd have something to recover. I worked in a mine where a guy fell down a reamed rays once. It was not a pretty sight. Uh, next. Two or three minutes. Okay. So here we are, we're now in the uh, hoist building. Uh, they did have one hoist left. They had several that had been removed. Joe said they used lots of electricity running these hoists. Uh, he says our bill reached a high of a million bucks a month. And then on the right there, uh, they had a bell system. He explains that the hoist, hoist man would run that. He says he'll go about a thousand feet a minute, slowing down top and bottom because it has a safety device. Uh, called a slow down cam on the Lily controller. Um, so, and then also I don't have a photo of it, but they also had the mine monitoring system in the hoist house. Uh, Joe explains he could, the monitor there, could look at the entire site, surface and underground. All the fence was alarmed. He knew if something, someone was rubbing against a fence, the vibration could monitor everything underground, fire doors, water flow, water level, transformer temperatures, electrical, real-time electrical power usage, things like that. Okay, next slide. So mining ended here in January of 1990 and 350 million pounds of uranium produced in the district during that time frame. And there's a very large ore reserve that remains. Uh, next, next part of the slide. Now in 2010, there was an increase in the price of uranium and there was some renewed interest in the district. After all, some of these corporations had uh, left. I mean, there was a lot of resources there to be developed. There were known resources um, and in, in situ leaching was considered. Uh, and that would involve uh, not a lot of people to run that operation. But a lot of other concerns as well, such as whether they could get the permits from the state, opposition from the uh, local Native American tribes, such as the Navajo. Um, and so there are a lot of issues that uh, were in play there. Uh, next. And so, um, so in December of 2019, uh, just recently, you know, Rio Grande Resources 
uh, firmly announced their plans to close the Mount Taylor mine. Uh, so Joe says about quitting in January of 1990, he said, we took everything out from underground, the rail, the pipe, the power cable, the pumps, the fans, the electrical circuits, everything was removed. And they placed it on wet standby, which uh, costs uh, several million dollars just to keep it in that way. And the Mount Taylor mine certainly has one of the largest reserves of any mine in the district. And next slide. So for now, the sun has set on the Mount Taylor mine. Thank you.